This is the question I got from the last office hours, so it'll be the topic of this video. If you have a question you'd like me to answer, please leave a comment and I'll try to get to it. This is Office Hours, a series of videos answering questions about statistics and biostatistics that you might have. In this video, I'll give some thoughts about how I might suggest someone approach studying this topic. If you're new to the channel, welcome. My name's Christian and I'm a biostatistics PhD student. I created this channel because I wanted to expand statistical knowledge. When I decided to get a master's degree, I knew that there would be a price to pay. Master's degrees can be very expensive. I would recommend that anyone looking into to a degree like this, look into the costs and investigate their own situation to see if it's really appropriate for them. I definitely needed to take out student loans for the master's degree, and it's something I need to consider as I progress in my PhD degree as well. For some of you, getting loans might not be feasible or desirable, or you might not even have the time to dedicate to a full-time degree. So if you still want to learn biostatistics, what are your options? I originally created this channel just for this purpose, but as of now, my library is still pretty small, so the material isn't really developed yet. But it's a goal for the channel, so please consider subscribing if you'd like to see more of that. In the meantime, what you can do is study on your own time. Self-studying is essentially a form of research, and it's how most PhD students and PhD candidates get new skills that they need for their research. But I know that it can be especially difficult to start from scratch, especially when you don't come from a background in math or statistics. In this video, I'll try to recommend skills, knowledge, and materials for the person who wants to self-study biostatistics. So let's get started. I've mentioned this in my bootstrap video, but it's worth saying again here. Practical statistics nowadays is done with the computer and code, not paper and pencil. So the first skill you should be learning is a statistical programming language. I recommend learning R because it's widely used and widely sought for in other employers. But if you want to learn Python, then that's good too. But the point is to get proficient in a single language. There's no point in picking up multiple languages and not being really good at any of them. In the age of ChatGPT, it's much easier to master one and then translate that mastery into questions that which you can translate into another language. What do I mean by proficient? Proficiency in a statistical programming language means being able to take a research question, translate it into a statistical model, and translate that statistical model into code that you can run on your computer. That's doing statistics. I find that a lot of tutorials on programming languages act as kind of like a shallow run through of the language and stop short of how it's really used in practical applications. Here's the data types, here's the data structures, this is how you make a for loop, this is how you make a function. If you're new to statistics and programming languages, they'll all be just a bunch of random facts that won't be really relevant to you, and it's far more likely that you'll quickly forget everything you learn if you stuff it all at once. But I'll cover some points on how to overcome this weakness later in the video. Thankfully, it's really easy to find cheap and free resources for learning programming languages online. You can easily search for something like Learn R or Learn R Free on Google and see what you get. Places like Code Academy offer guided courses and practice exams, while YouTube offers full-on video tutorials which you could just watch and run through. Don't get caught up on the small details, it's more important to just pick one and stick with it and learn from it. As you learn more statistical models and ideas, it's important to see how they're implemented in R itself, and this is most commonly done with the function. You can ask how this function works with Google, or you can even just ask ChatGPT on how it might work in an example case. You can see what the function is, what kind of inputs you need to give to the function, and even better, you should be able to try to use that function in a practice case and try to investigate the outputs and see if you can understand them. Before I move on, there's something I'd have to emphasize to my viewers. I've structured this video as a list because it's easy to digest. Lists are linear and linear is really easy for us to understand. But the actual learning process that you'll undergo is emphatically non-linear. Don't treat this list too literally. What I mean is, don't spend all of your time only focusing on the first item of this list while ignoring the other parts of the list, because they all interrelate in some way. You shouldn't try to trick yourself into being done with the first part of the list and thinking that you won't have to come back to it at a later time. Most efficient learning will require you to look back at concepts time and time again to make sure that you have those connections really strong. Statistics applies concepts from probability, so I recommend learning that as a field as well. If you don't know some basic concepts and theorems from probability, it's unlikely that you'll ever be able to really use statistics in a meaningful way. One thing that's nice about statistics though and biostatistics 
is that it takes abstract math objects and gives them real-world applications, which makes them easier to understand. For technical things like probability, I recommend learning from a textbook. I'm going to recommend one to you, but if you have another that you like or you've just heard from someone else, then by all means, go with that one. The ideas of probability that you need to know have been established for so long that it's unlikely that different textbooks will have radically different treatments of that subject. It's important just to get the basic ideas and main concepts. In both my master's and my PhD degree, we use this textbook. In my opinion, I think the first five chapters provide a good enough foundation for moving on to statistics and applying those concepts. What's nice about the Casella textbook is that the authors actually wrote a nice answer key for all the problems that are in the textbook. And of course, you should be doing these practice problems because you're applying your knowledge, or else you're just reading and not really retaining that knowledge in a useful way. If you Google these things, I think you'll find that they're pretty accessible online, if you know what I mean. Now, if you want to learn more about biostatistics, it makes sense that you learn from a biostatistics textbook. Textbooks just have the advantage of being able to organize the basic concepts in a coherent way that makes sense to an expert, and it'll help give you something to organize your own knowledge off of. Knowing R and probability from before will better set you up to understand the models that you encounter in these textbooks. Like with probability, most of the fundamental statistics ideas are so old that most textbooks will cover them to some degree. I use the Rander textbook in my master's program, so that's what I'm gonna recommend here. Specifically recommending a biostatistics textbook because biostatistics is naturally an application of statistics. And I found that the more applied an example is, the easier it is for newcomers to understand the concepts that they're trying to test you on. And as you get through the textbook, you should be weaving your knowledge of probability in R with it. I keep mentioning this because it's the most frequent issue I encounter as a teacher's assistant to students coming in with questions. It's not enough to know what a two-sample t-test is. You really only understand it after learning it, getting some data, putting it in the function in R, and understanding the output of that test. Statistical programming language, a probability textbook, and a biostatistics textbook. These are what I recommend if you want to start self-studying biostatistics on your own time. The resources on my channel aren't sufficient yet, so this video will have to suffice for now. But before I end this video, there's one last tip I should recommend to you before you start your journey. Know your end game. There's probably a reason you want to learn statistics. Maybe you want to switch careers or you suddenly need it for your job. We gain these skills because we want to earn more money. So keep in mind that this tip is mostly aimed at those people. If you want to be a statistician, you should also be looking up statistician job positions on a place like LinkedIn. The same thing applies for data analysts and data scientist positions as well. You're probably learning statistics to get a fighting chance for one of these positions, so you should do your due diligence and see what these jobs are actually asking for. A good statistician has many other qualities besides programming ability and technical knowledge, and you'll see what these are in the bullet points of these postings. Know your endgame job so you can work towards the particular needs of that job. The things I talk about this video are only intended to give you basic foundation of statistics so that you can start applying it to basic problems, but the job descriptions will give you more explicit descriptions of actual skills they might need. This might be something like survival analysis, or causal inference. And this can help as a jumping point to other knowledge that you might need to acquire and find resources for. Learning in a classroom setting is really convenient because the professors already decided what you should be learning. Self-studying is really hard, but if you're self-studying, you need to define that yourself. Spending the time to define the skills you need ahead of time will save you a lot of time, effort, and heartache. Unlike classrooms, where the point is to get a good grade on a test, the point of self-studying is to enrich yourself to better improve your outcomes in the future, whatever they may be. I hope this video has been helpful to you. If you think I've earned it, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. Thanks again for watching. This has been another Office Hours. I'll see you in the next one.